So I watched this conversation with uh, Adam Friended and Paul Vanderclay, and I really got to say, this is this this conversation is excellent. Uh, I strongly recommend it to everybody. I guess I will post it in the description. Um, I will post a link to it in the description. I strongly recommend you check it out. Uh, Paul Vanderclay, if you do not know, he is debatably one of the best Christian YouTube channels out there. Not the best. No, that's this channel. Yes, it is. It's this channel right here that you're listening to. Yes, it is. Paul Vanderclay doesn't interview Seth Andrews. I do. We do. Paul, interview, Paul Vanderclay doesn't interview Paul Gia. We do right here. So, it's not quite the best Christian YouTube channel, but it's certainly one of the best. Uh, my only complaint is he puts out way too much content. He puts out about six hours of videos a week, at least, seven. I have about an hour. I watch about an hour of his videos every single week. Uh, that's about all I can swing. I only got about three extra hours to watch YouTube videos on a given week, so six hours is longer than I, time than I have. But it's a, it's a very, very, very excellent, very, very good Christian YouTube channel. I strongly recommend you check it out. So... He is discussing things with my friend Adam Friended. And one of the things that they bring up is metaphorical truths. Now, I'm not completely pleased, and I pointed this out in some of my last videos, with Brett Weinstein's framing of metaphorical truth. He describes it as a useful fiction. Something that is, not lit that is literally false, but metaphorically true. I don't think that that's a good way to frame a metaphorical truth, as I've explained in the past. It makes it sound too... It, it's just, it just doesn't quite get to the point, to the heart of what it actually is. A metaphorical truth isn't necessarily false. It's just not necessarily literally true in all situations. The example I like to use, and that's a big difference, actually. The example I like to use is that which doesn't kill me makes me stronger. The famous aphorism from Nietzsche, the famous phrase from Nietzsche, that which doesn't kill me make, makes me stronger. Now, is that particular phrase literally true? No. There are plenty of things that don't kill you and don't make you one iota stronger. You get hit by a bus and you're in a wheelchair. Guess what? It can kill you, <laughs> but, but if you're going around saying it makes me stronger, no, not really. So why is it a metaphorical truth? Because it is true metaphorically speaking, really usefully true in certain circumstances. And in order for us to understand those circumstances, we have to cooperate with the intent of the phrase. So let's say you're at work and you're having a difficult situation at work and uh, you know, you're, you're struggling with your boss. Your boss is out to get you and he's piling all this work on you and he's saying, he's saying you know, he's making all these demands of you and you go home and you start telling your wife about it and she goes, well, you know what Nietzsche said, don't you, Craig? What's that, honey? That which doesn't kill me makes me stronger. What does she mean in that context? She means you're going to learn from this experience and you're going to grow and it's going to make you a better person. It's going to help develop your character and you're going to learn to handle people better and handle difficult situations better. So in that particular context, te 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 text, it's completely metaphorically true. Again, not quite literally true. Not quite literally true in all circumstances, but definitely not literally false. That's the part that I object to with Brett Weinstein's framing. Now, the, the example that they used in this particular chat, I don't like either of, you know, apparently there's this tribe somewhere that has trained itself to, you know, see the, about watching waves when the, when the wave, when the, when the tidal wave is about to hit the hit the shore and the waves disappear, they've got some story that they tell themselves as to why, that, why that's happening now, run for the hills. Okay, it's, it's a little bit too specific, so it's not quite that useful of a fiction in all circumstances. Really specific to a tidal wave. So it's not really all that useful of a fiction. But having said that, the, the thing that I really liked in the video, Paul, Paul Vanderclay starts talking about school spirit, the spirit of a school. Now, this is something I've tried to introduce a lot. Um, and this is something that's really, really useful because there is a place in reality that even the naturalists like Adam Friended can agree where the subjective and the objective meet in actual fact. Like Paul is talking about school spirit. We all know there's such a thing as school spirit. And we can say this school has more school spirit than that school. And it's something that permeates the entire school. So I was saying in a tweet, 
We can even like it to something like when Paul is talking about powers and principalities. When Paul is referring to powers and principalities in the Bible, what most standard Christian interpretation is that those are demonic entities, that um, evil spirits that dominate an entire region or dominate an entire area. That's what most standard Christian interpretations of when Paul's talking about powers and principalities is. Now, that may not be literally true, okay? But again, this is where the subjective and the objective meet in reality. So we can see that there is such a thing as a power in a principality if we are, dis if we are defining spirit in a much more vague, much more watered-down, secular interpretation, so that you say, like, school spirit. So now let's take the idea of, like, there's a spirit of Nazism, for example, that was prevalent in Nazi Germany. And if you went to a Nazi party rally, it's really easy to say that all of the Nazis at the rally were possessed to one degree or another by a spirit of Nazism which meant they were more racially, you know, racist, they were more charged up with nationalism, they were more militaristic than, a, than a, another group of people in another stadium somewhere else. So we could say that a spirit of Nazism has dominating that particular group of people. And in that sense, it's exactly like Paul is talking about, a power and a principality. Matter of fact, it's so much like Paul is talking about that when Nazi, when in 1933, when Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, now all of a sudden we have Nazi Germany, which means the entire country became kind of like what Paul is talking about, a power and a principality. An entire region, an entire nation dominated by the spirit of Nazism. It permeated everything. It permeated the teachings in the, in the school. You had Hitler Youth. They would teach Nazism in the school system. They changed the laws in, I think, 34 or 35 to the Nuremberg Laws. That's when the persecutions of the Jews began, where if you were, um, they, they made a whole series of laws where they basically legally, legally, mind you, took away the rights of Jewish people, all of their rights within the society, legally. Um, so it became a spirit of Nazism that permeated the entire country, shaped everything about the country. All of a sudden, they were building up their military. They were, you know, um, getting ready to invade other nations. They were all, they would have uh, rallies and Nazi speeches. Nazism started to dominate everything in the country. In that sense, it was kind of like a power and a principality, very similar to what Paul is talking about in the New Testament. So I just thought that was interesting to know. Uh, I will go somewhere with that information somewhere in the future. And the other thing... that Paul brought up that I thought was a really, really useful, a really, really insightful idea, especially coming from a, a, a Christian who's a pastor, because he seems to understand something that I've understand, understood clearly for a long time, but I wasn't raised as a Christian, and I'm not a pastor, so I was pretty much a secular person until I was 28, 29 years old. Um, it's rare that a pastor expresses this kind of intuitive understanding of there is some form of compromise being made. And I've talked about this in some of my old videos with when we are practicing Christians and there's these people who have this interpretation of which, which verses in the Bible and which principles in the Bible are sacrosanct and there's these group of Christians who have their interpretation of which principles, which, which ideas in the Bible are sacrosanct. And they are different sometimes. And sometimes which ideas win out have more to do with their practical utility in the real world than they have to do with what is actually, you know, spiritually speaking, prayerfully considered the absolute correct interpretation of the scriptures, which I honestly don't think any of us are really privy to, being that, you know, we aren't exactly God. So, in other words, when I started talking about, and I'm going to bring this up a lot in videos to come, um, I don't know how many of you have paid attention to this, this Benny Hinn. I don't know who listened to this video even knows who Benny Hinn is. But apparently, he is recently, he's a pretty well-known preacher in the United States of America. And I've got videos to come where I'm going to post on this particular subject. Because apparently he has repented 
of what is commonly referred to as the prosperity gospel. Now, one of the reasons why I think the prosperity gospel actually took root, I'm relatively certain Paul Vanderclay would be at least nominally opposed to the the prosperity gospel on spiritual <laughs> and spiritual principles, as, as would I, as would a lot of people. Um, but one of the reasons why the prosperity gospel took root, which I'm going to explore in some of my videos to come, is that it, it served such practical utility to when you, when you start a church, you know, I mean, let's be realistic about it. There's a real world out there, and you, you start a church, you have to buy a building, bills need to be paid, you either have to pay for the church itself, or you have to rent out the land, you have to rent out the building. Either way, bills got to be paid. And, you know, 90, when, when, you, when you were first starting out in particular, uh, Paul Vanderclay would probably be able to talk about this a lot better than I would, but my, my just best educated guess is that it's a lot easier to raise money if you lean in to a certain segment of the church population who are a lot more committed, who are going to come back time and time again. You know, debatably more credulous, and more gullible, and more willing to cough it up than if you, if you don't. And that's one of the things I'm going to explore in videos to come. So anyways, I'm going to re-listen to their conversation somewhere in the week and maybe do a more thorough counting of it. This is just intended as a check out their video couple ideas that they put in my mind that I felt like just throwing out there and that is all for now kids the mass has ended go in peace amen